Let's see, uh, let's uh, get, get going today. Uh, I think in the end of the class today, uh, uh, we'll hand out the exam sheets and you can have a look and uh, get back to us if you have questions. And also, we decided we'll have two office hours. I mean, um, the office hours on Thursday as usual and one on Monday next week as well. Uh, so we'll have, um, uh, you can come by to discuss things. Uh, okay, so um, uh, what we are, uh, uh, what we were looking at is I, I, we spent uh, uh, most of the entire uh, uh, the entire last class looking at uh, uh, how we uh, understand uh, uh, essentially the uh, perturbation theory, meaning if you have solved a problem exactly and then something changes, now how have your solutions changed, right? So that's really what we're looking at. And by applying uh, that perturbation theory to uh, 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 to, uh, to our exactly solved problem, which is the free electron problem, uh, which had a, you know, a dashed parabola band structure, and we subjected that to a periodic potential. Uh, and then what we saw was, uh, uh, you know, so essentially the periodic potential looked a, a cosine sort of potential. And, and uh, what that did to this energy band structure is it opened gaps, right? And uh, the magnitude of the gap uh, uh, you can calculate it exactly, and that's something you're doing in your current assignment as well. Uh, th this is the 1D problem, in which case uh, uh, one of the most important, I mean, few things to, uh, important points was uh, the periodicity of the pe potential that uh, uh, perturbs the electron is an extremely important parameter. And you take that periodicity, let's say A, and 2 pi by that is a characteristic uh, wave vector, K. And, uh, uh, and what we found was uh, uh, the states, uh, uh, what that does, what that periodic potential does, is it, 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 it couples in states uh, uh, which are separated by exactly that you know, k vector, which is 2 pi by a is g. So if I have two states like that, or like that, or like that, I mean, uh, they're all uh, coupled by this periodic potential. Right? That's, that's kind of the main idea here. And, and this idea will, kind of help you uh, understand uh, the effect of periodic potentials in all dimensions. This is just 1D, but in 3D, 2D, whatever, it's the same deal. Right? So it's just coupled states which have, so that periodic potential essentially scatters, if you might, uh, an electron uh, from here to there. Originally, they were not talking to each other, but now because of the potential, they can. Right? So, so that, that's essentially the main idea of uh, perturbation theory, uh, for the free electron. Right? And as a result of that, what we uh, also realize is that uh, uh, from perturbation theory analysis that uh, states that are equal in energy get you know, uh, affected the most, and the ones that are farther apart in energy get affected, but weaker. Right? I mean, and, and so that goes as one over the energy difference between the two. Right? So, so that's another thing, and which is why uh, these, particular, these two states, exactly plus g by 2 and minus g by 2, are uh, essentially, their energies and wave functions are changed the most violently, and then essentially you get a large gap here. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's that's the origin of the gap. And uh, uh, now, um, if I look at all the energies uh, that were allowed before and that are allowed now, uh, this is all these energies were allowed. I mean, there's some discreteness to it. We realize that if it's a particle on a ring, there are you know many discrete but closely spaced points. But here's my energy band for the free electron. Right, but now in the periodic potential, this this energy, uh, the, the 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 range of energies within this window goes missing. It's not allowed anymore. Right, so and not only that, we also saw that the lowest state here gets pushed down by plus g and minus g. So that kind of goes down a little bit, and so the band, electron energy band now, looks like this. So essentially, there's a gap. There's a continuous states now here like that, and then there's again continuous states over there. Right. So that's so now your energy spectrum of the electron has developed bands and gaps and bands and so on. So and this will repeat periodically. So also not periodically, but it will repeat in the energy space. Uh, some interesting points here, and I'm going to spend a few minutes describing that in detail today. Uh, first things first, the lowest energy state here, because of a periodic potential with like a zero average value, which is the cosine potential, gets pushed down a little bit. And immediately you can say that if I have an electron that was initially free, right? So initially that electron was 
was uh, you know f uh, free to move and v potential was zero and on top of it i have added this you know small periodic potential right and because of the periodic potential what we are seeing is uh, let's say this this periodic potential is a crystal like maybe a nanotube or something like that or a one dimensional nanotube but it has a finite extent it it, you know, it doesn't go on forever so in that case you can see that as long as the electron is inside this region its minimum energy is going to be lower than if it was outside right? because this energy has been pushed down does it make sense right the minimum energy allowed will be lower and that really is uh, uh, also you know kind of indicates that this is the reason why the electron would rather stay inside the crystal than escape into vacuum right does that make sense i mean it will like to stay in the crystal because it has a lower energy in the crystal right? even though even though the average potential energy is zero it's, it's a you know cosine potential so its average is zero even so because the potential has turned on interactions and the lowest energy got pushed down now the electron would rather stay in the crystal rather than get out and that's the origin of like the work function why would the electron stay in a metal rather than be outside right so that's uh, I mean to calculate a real work function you need to kind of do a lot more work than this but the basic <coughs> idea is just this that that you know it, 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 it has a lower energy and therefore it will prefer to stay so it's uh, uh, saying is for this particular problem this is our work function now this little decrease so, yeah. uh, okay uh, the second thing you notice is uh, uh, the total number of electron states allowed has not changed. It, it has all just got redistributed. Okay. So what this potential did was it kind of you know, pushed out states. And as a result, in 1D, as you know, if you curve like this in one dimension, you have much more bunching. So the density of states kind of goes up a little bit here. Does that make sense? And density of states goes up a little bit here too because it you know, got bunched up. So in pictures, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're full before the periodic potential. My energies look like that. And my density of states, G1D. This is what I'm saying is true for 1D, but you know, the general concept is true for all dimensions, two dimension, three dimension, all that. So uh, how did the density of states look for one dimensional EK, like parabolic EK? Right? So it's, anybody? I think your, your hand motions are correct, you know, but so it is, it goes down with energy, right? And it goes down as one over square root of energy, right? So it, it kind of does that. One over square root of energy for 1D. Right. Okay. So now uh, we're saying we have turned on this periodic potential, and what happened is that plus g by two, uh, which is plus pi by a, which is plus g by two, and minus pi by a. Uh, so we go up here, and those states, you know, get put up very heavily. And let me. I, luckily, there's a color chalk here. So essentially, it did something like this, right? So, and, and, and similarly, on top also it pushed up and it did something like that. Okay. Something like that. Okay. It curves around, I think. Yeah. Right. So, uh, as you can see, how will the density of states look now? Right. Density of states, first of all, how will it look inside this window? Right? Inside that window, none. none. There's zero. There's, the density has to vanish. Right? It has to vanish, and, and and so therefore I can plot that things I know I plot first. Right. So this is zero. There's no dust there. Right? Uh, it's gone. All, all the states are gone, and that's because the periodic potential really pushed it out of there. And and then now uh, it start out here, and uh, here's kind of an interesting question now. Uh, so. Uh, as you know, if you have a curvature and there's a minima or a maxima of any curve, right, it's parabolic, right? I mean, the first order term is missing, the derivative is zero, right? So there's no linear term, it's parabolic here, right? And therefore, you can define uh, also a, a slightly different mass, which is not necessarily the free mass of this, but that's, that curvature is what's related to the effective mass. And, 
And uh, now you will have a slight, so what I'm trying to say now is you have effectively a parabola that's kind of going like that. You have another parabola that's like going like that. And the <laughs> curvature of that parabola is not necessarily the one of this one, right? right? And more curved it is, the smaller the mass, effective mass, and the you know, less curved it is, the higher the effective mass. And I'm going to talk about the effective mass a little bit more. But uh, and, and here you have positive, it's curving up. Here you have negative, it's curving down. So we'll say that this has a negative effective mass. Regardless, how will the density of states look? How, what shape will it take? You know, because it was going as 1 over square root of energy, but now it suddenly vanished in this window. But now you can see that it will kind of go back up again, right? Because I have a lot of states there. And then how will it go in energy again? Right? It'll also go as 1 over square root of energy because the problem is still one dimensional. It has really not changed from that perspective. It has, it's still one dimensional, right? So it, it kind of goes down like that. And interestingly, on this side, it will go this way as 1 over square root of energy. Right? So 1 over square root of uh, the way to write it is you'll write it as E minus this particular energy. And we're going to just label it you know, in anticipation of what it will become as EC, which will be the conduction band edge, for example. You know, and, and, and this edge, this energy, we'll label it as EV for now. This is a valence band edge. So I mean, I'll write that expression as 1 over square root of E minus EC. Right? So that's how it's going to go. And there'll be mass, but that mass, uh, th there are some terms sitting in the front there which has the mass, and that mass will not be necessarily the free electron mass anymore. And similarly here also, you can, you know, mathematically at least, you can write 1 over square root of, you know, E minus EV, but you can, you know, m make sure that you, are, you have the right direction because the energy would be kind of increasing that way now. Right? So uh, I don't want to, you know, write that because it just has, physically it's clear what you're doing as you get away from this edge. It's going down as 1 over square root of energy. Okay. So uh, uh, now if I come in and I, say I, I have a certain number of, uh, so by the way, uh, and, and then let me complete this picture. Right? So now you have gone down, you have a little work function because of this thing. So the density of states will come down, but what will happen at 0 here? Right? It again starts as 1. So essentially this band is going to look something like this. You know? That's how this whole, uh, sorry, this DOS is going to look something like that. <coughs> Because uh, in, a, in a certain sense, I mean, this part is not aware really of what is going on very far. It, it is aware, it's got a, push, push, got a little push down. Yeah. And then this will repeat. In fact, we see the first gap opens at plus pi by a, and there'll be another gap which will open now at 2 pi by a, at, at uh, th 3 pi by a, and all that. So there'll be another gap there. So essentially, your density of state starts kind of you know, going down, and it'll come back up again, and there'll be another gap. And this repeats again and again. And I haven't told you exactly why there'll be a second gap, but we'll do that right now. Is that clear at least? I mean, what, you know, the bigger picture is you had uh, 1 over square root of DOS before the periodic potential, and now it has, a, 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 you know, really uh, uh, acquired a lot of uh, structure to it because of the periodic potential. And it's repeating between allowed bands, gaps, bands, gaps, and so on. Right. And now, uh, depending upon how many electrons, so this is you know, the free electron, meaning this is the situation that electrons would have to encounter uh, if they're in the crystal. Now you can ask the question that I'm going to start filling electrons into it. Okay. I'm still going to start filling 10 to the power you know, 9 per centimeter, 10 to the power you know, 7 per centimeter electrons into it. And if I fill very few electrons, essentially you start from here, and this is your DOS. You kind of, you know, maybe I fill only half of it, and I'm done. In which case, your Fermi level is lying inside a band, right? And even the smallest amount of voltage can flow current because these electrons can go up and down in energy. They can scatter into higher states. They can conduct current now. So this is a half-filled state, which is a metal. Right? And I, I keep filling, keep filling. And then at some, there'll come some point of time when I just, you know, kind of fill this whole thing, and this is completely empty, right? And in which case now that is an insulator, because now if I apply a very small field, this band is complete, you know, and, and it's a fill band just like the closed shells of, you know, helium and neon and argon. It's, it's, it's that was unreactive. This is. It doesn't respond to electric fields because this band is complete and there's no, no external current flow because of a filled band. So, okay. 
uh, physically what it's uh, what it means is if I look at the band structure this is the band structure right and in the band structure e versus k uh, uh, you, you you have all the states are filled right and therefore when you apply an electric field you can imagine maybe I'm just kind of you know they're going through a little ring like operation but the net current is always zero because when you sum all the groove velocities of this, there's exactly balanced by that. Of this, that's exactly balanced by that, right? So the current is zero. This is what's called a longitudinal current. From you know, if you take this, uh, say, a nanotube, uh, and then you connect to it two electrodes and flow current through it, if your Fermi level, if you have filled up all these states and these are all empty, there won't be current flow through it. I mean, that's what we mean by that. But if it is halfway, then It'll, it's metallic, there'll be a lot of current flow. Because now, you can imagine that if your states were only filled till here, and you come in with an electric field, then you know that your Ks can increase here, and they can, essentially what you can do is, your, your, your occupation function will go from a symmetric to an asymmetric version, and you can have current flow then. Right? So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, now, uh, so that's kind of the bigger story here. Uh, let me point out, uh, uh, maybe uh, you, you, you can uh, tell me. So, so one of the things we, we, we realize now is there will be gaps at plus minus pi by a. But now I'm also saying that at 2 pi by a, uh, there will also be a gap. And so will it be in minus 2 pi by a, and then minus 3 pi by a, and, and, and so on. There will be gaps at all these points. So there will be this sort of energy gaps. And that's actually interesting. It may or may not be obvious, uh, uh, but if you look at the, uh, <coughs> you know, a picture like this, uh, it becomes a little more clear. So remember, with uh, the simplest periodic potential, which is minus two times some strength cosine of two pi by a times x. So this has only one period, and that's what we call as g, you know, which is two pi by a. <coughs> So that only couples states that are separated by you know, the re reciprocal lattice vector, which is G. It's, it, it coupled those two states, it coupled those two states, it coupled those two states, and so on. Right? Right? Now, now uh, why should there be a gap at, at uh, um, 2 pi by, uh, meaning, let's see. So if I go up here and I look at this state, you know, which is plus G. So plus G is going to interact with only states that are separated by it by, you know, the G, ve the, the G vector, right? So the plus G state will interact with this one directly. Right? And yes, it will, it, its energy will get perturbed, but it's not clear to me why it should open a gap. It doesn't look like a very, very big perturbation. It's, it's you know, it's widely separated in energy. Does that make sense? Uh, remember perturbation theory result that the change, at least the second order correction to energy eigenvalues goes as, you know, some perturbation matrix element squared divided by, you know, E1 minus E2 if these two are the energies that are getting, you know, talking to each other, right? And because the denominator is huge, I'm expecting that this state, yeah, it'll be pushed up, but not too much. Right? So, but then you can ask, well, uh, and can this state talk to that state, right? And that periodic potential is not allowing that, right? Because it's only going to allow, remember, if your K is, uh, uh, this W12 is equal to minus 2 times, uh, what was it, minus UG probably, yeah, times, you, you had to had, you know, K1 minus K2 should be plus minus G. If not, this is zero. There's no interaction term, in which case this term vanishes. Right? Does that make sense? So for a direct interaction, you know, plus G and minus G don't talk to each other, right? But now uh, there are, but you can see now what you can do is this can interact with this, and that's interacting with that for sure, right? So this, this is what's called an indirect interaction. This state you know, with that, with that, right? So, so that's the indirect or second order interaction. And that turns out to be actually reasonably strong, you know, which is uh, meaning it's much weaker than the interaction between these two states, but it is stronger than interaction between these two states. Does that make sense? I mean, so, so what you are winning there is, you know, you have a little, you know, the difference in energy term, but it's not quite the two, but it's an indirect interaction which kind of wins out a little bit, right? So as a result, you also have a gap here. 
we, you know, because because of this indirect interaction, they split, and so uh, and uh, the order of the gap, the second gap, and this you can show. How would you calculate the gap here? You know, how would you calculate how much gap am I getting at this window here? Right. So maybe I can pause here for a second. How, how would I go about calculating what is the splitting because of the interaction between this, this, and that? Right. So when, uh, whenever I uh, ask you uh, about anything about how do you calculate energy eigenvalues, there's, you can always give me the most general answer or just solve the matrix problem, right? And that's what you really are going to do here. You have three states, right? You have plus g, zero, and minus g. Right? You have three states, so you get a three by three matrix. Does that make sense? You just take that matrix, you know the energies, this is, is to start with, this is zero, this is you know, eight square, g square by twice mass, this is also eight square, g square by twice mass, and you have a matrix that looks, <coughs> let, me write, uh, let me write that down. Uh, so this is a general strategy for finding eigenvalues, okay? So whatever we're doing, all these analytical formulas are always an approximation to the matrix problem, okay? So, so now I'm saying I, I put state zero plus G and minus G. These are the three states that are gonna to talk to each other because of the periodic potential. And I have minus G, zero, and plus G. I, I just, you know, arrange it that way. You can arrange it in whatever way you want. It doesn't, you know, it's a linear. Uh, uh, matrix is a linear, so they don't care exactly how you arrange them. And now I, I can write down my terms. Maybe you can help me to write down the terms here. What term would that be? What is the energy unperturbed for this zero interacting with zero itself by itself? Right? Zero. That's zero, right? I mean, that's that's essentially your unperturbed eigenvalue energy, zero, right? And what is it here? You know, minus g with minus g. So minus g. So what is its unperturbed eigenvalue? Right? right, right. So what you do is, uh, it's, so it's a free electron, right? And except now the k is not g by 2, but it's full you know, g, right? which is 2 pi by 2 pi by a, not pi by a. Right? And similarly here, same deal. Plus g also has the same energy by symmetry. a square by 2 me, g square by 2 m. Right? Okay, so we got the diagonal unperturbed matrix elements right away. Now look at the off diagonals. Uh, what about, let's do the easy ones first. What is, what is this term? Plus g with minus g. Zero. zero, it's direct interaction is zero, remember, because they're not separated by, you know, plus minus g, they're separated by plus two g, right? They're separated by twice the g, so they're, they're, that term is actually zero. And uh, this is the Hamiltonian matrix. It's always Hermitian. So you know you can write that zero. You don't have to think about it anymore. So it's always symmetric around the axis here, you know, diagonal, right? Uh, now, uh, uh, and uh, what about zero with minus g? Right? So that's just the perturbation potential coefficient, right? Minus ug, right? just that because they are indeed separated by g, so now you have minus ug, and you can check now all of these will be just minus ug, minus ug, and minus ug, right? so they're all the same, right? And so now you've got to you know, find eigenvalues of this, and, uh, uh, and so that's your unperturbed uh, matrix uh, in the diagonal and perturbation terms in the off-diagonal terms, and you, when you find the eigenvalues, you will see uh, uh, that uh, you know, you, you'll be able to exactly calculate the gap. Now, does that make sense? I mean, you exactly get the gap from uh, the, uh, the eigenvalues. And in fact, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'll just show up here. Uh, all right. So I just wrote those down, uh, and 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 the gap uh, for that with the, the gap for that would be. Let me write it this way. Uh, this term I'm going to define as f is eight square g by two whole square by twice of mass of electron. This is a characteristic energy scale. It's the energy of the first gap, where the first gap occurs. Just a characteristic energy scale. We're redefining it as a F. If that's so, the gap here, the second gap, is uh, you can show from here will be UG squared by uh, twice F or 4F, something like that. That will be the second gap. 
uh, u g squared by twice f, right? Okay. So, uh, right. So that is that here? I mean, that that that's the second gap. And what you can show, actually, if you want to, you can prove that the as you go to higher, you know, you go to this is pi by a, it's two pi by a, there's three pi by a, there's another gap here because of all these, you know, indirect interactions again. And that that gap, then the third term, uh, the third gap will go as u g. So the first gap, if you remember, is uh, two times u g. So it's u g to the power, you know, uh, one. Second gap is u g to the power two. Third gap will be e to the power three with some normalization factors in the denominator. All of them have units of energy. And the nth gap will have ug to the power n. So, and effectively, you can write it as, uh, you know, you can write this as ug over f, uh, whole square times uh, some factor one over two. Uh, uh, so essentially, you know, if the periodic potential is a certain fraction of this a uh, first, uh, uh, you know, unperturbed gap energy, uh, then then uh, it gets smaller and smaller. That's when ba basically f is much larger than u g. Okay. The the this term is much larger than that. In which case, the gaps get smaller and smaller as you go up higher in energy because of this in this problem. So, yeah. Okay. So and and. Uh, uh, and then similarly, uh, yeah. Okay. I I'll, I'll kind of. Uh, uh, any, any any particular questions about this or is that here? Yeah. So why do the G terms matter so much? Because couldn't we have like the state G minus plus G minus pi over A talking to the state negative pi over A, which is also talking to the state negative G minus pi over A? Why did... Oh, definitely. So they're all, again, you can, you're absolutely right. So for example, I choose a little off state here and or you know this state with that state with that state they're all the, but whenever you have uh, you know a, 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 a degeneracy in the energy right so this state and that state and there's a match between two things one is the energy and with the g vectors that's when it kind of the interaction really blow not blows up it, it it's it's at its maximum you know. so so as a result the gaps really show up at at those wavelengths particular wavelengths and not at all uh, all wavelengths you know. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, uh, that's when the electron wavelength becomes resonant, really. Uh, uh, one way to also look at it is the, as you go up here, uh, so here's your periodic crystal of the atom, right? Uh, here's the periodic crystal of the uh, 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 periodic you know, arrangement of atoms. So the first gap occurs when, uh, you know, let's, I'm going to just write it this way, when the wavelength of electron it's kind of maybe doing something like that. That's the, the second gap occurs when the wavelength is doing, you know, something like that. It's still resonant, right? But it's a higher order resonance now. Third, you know, maybe there are more. So as as you go up, it, it's still resonating every now and then, you know. So so that's the physically why it's developing the gaps at those points. Okay. So uh, now, uh, yeah, Alex. We, yeah, uh, so let's see, uh, you are asking, is there a reason we considered this first or we didn't, uh, so plus minus g by 2 is a, uh, it is the smallest, uh, you know, because uh, the wavelength uh, is, is uh, actually the longest uh, to, to be resonant and and so this will will define now as the first blue and zone and we're going to you know be, Are you asking where I haven't we haven't talked about it? I, I didn't get the question Okay, maybe I'll discuss the, uh, about that right now uh, about the billion zone and the concept of it and then perhaps you can You know t tell me if the, if the question still uh, is unanswered uh, All right, so um, <clears throat> So, so in general, uh, so you have the rearrange, rearrangement of the dots and the bands, and the gaps get successively smaller as you go up higher in energy. That's kind of the other thing I wanted to mention here. And they're smaller because it's really not a direct interaction at the higher energies. It's, it's an indirect interaction. Right? Now, you notice something very interesting uh, that if I have uh, an, el an electron, uh, let's say I have a metal. OK, 
okay, and I have an electron that is only filled, in, maybe this, this band is only filled halfway, let's say. Or forget about that, let's just look at a one electron. It has only one electron, the lowest, uh, lowest band here has only one electron. And then I come in with an electric field and it starts moving. Right? You, this is one of the problems you're solving now. Right? Uh, so in response to an electric field, uh, uh, I'm going to maybe sketch it here again. Uh, the bands So I have a band that looks you know, something like that. And then I have another band that looks something like that. The second band, right, E versus K. And what I'm, the problem I'm looking at is, let's say I, I started out with an electron sitting at, at ground state, and I apply an electric field. And when I apply the electric field, uh, the electron starts changing its K vector, right? Right, and it starts you know, moving in K, the electric field essentially sweeps it in K, right? The electric field really doesn't care what your energy band structure is, it's just gonna change K according to this equation. That's all it does, right? So, for example, if the field is constant and it's one dimension, your K is increasing linearly. I mean, right, that's very, you, know, you get it directly from here. Uh, so the field, this is the field, and you get uh, what, F over H bar times T, right? That's how it's changing, it's linearly increasing with time, plus, K, whatever it was at zero. Right. Right. And, 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 and now uh, what will happen is uh, clearly I mean, the electrons will start go here, go here, go here, right? It will start increasing. And then it reaches here and here. Right? So it reaches that point. Now that's a very interesting sort of uh, situation. Uh, uh, at that point, it is not, uh, no energy is available to it, right? It, you know, slightly higher than, that. there's no energy available to it, right? Does that make sense? I mean, uh, so, uh, so in classical mechanics, uh, all it can do, uh, uh, or rather, forget about classical mechan mechanics for a second. So, uh, so now you can see that uh, the, the only thing for it to do now is, uh, let, me, let me also look at physically what's going on. Here the slope is zero, and here the slope is positive, 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 so that means the velocity it's positive, it's going to the, let's say to the right, right? And then it reaches a, uh, and then the velocity keeps being positive, positive, but it starts decreasing. So, so it's decelerating. So it initially, it accelerates, and then it decelerates, right? Does that make sense? And reaches a zero velocity now, at this point. Right? Is that, yeah. So now, uh, what it can do at this point is, uh, it has obviously gained energy from the field, and uh, uh, at this point, it has actually two choices. Either it can gain a little more energy from the field and jump to that band. Okay. It, it has that possibility. That's one possibility. The other possibility is it gets scattered by the crystal, by the crystal potential. Right? There's a crystal as a periodic potential. It gets scattered, and it comes back and re-enters from here. Right? So, it, because the crystal has a potential that goes as minus two u g cosine of g x, right? And that you know that uh, that means you have e to the power i g x plus e to the power minus i g x. So this is uh, sorry, this was w. Okay, this is the crystal potential. And the crystal potential, if I were to plot it in real space, it is a simple cosine, right? But you can also plot it in k space, right? In k space, how does the crystal potential look? This potential. Uh, so in real space, we you know we know it's looking something like that. V of, but in k space, how does W of k look, right? It's a delta function. Right, exactly right. So you have basically only two values of k, plus g and minus g, right? Only two values, right? In case space, I mean, this is a pure sinusoid. I mean, I'm not saying uh, anything new here, but physically, you have like a plus g. I'll just plot mod square because there can be negative signs and all. But the strength of this periodic potential in case space is concentrated at plus g and at minus g, and there's nothing else left anywhere. Right? Right? That's the periodic potential if you have only one period. Right? 
So in which case, that what, what it physically means is that this periodic potential can in, impart to the electron momentum changes or k changes of plus and minus g freely. It can. Right? It can, you know, the electron can interfere and diffract and it can go back. So this process where it will start out here and kind of re-enter from here is called the Umklapp process. Right? Uh, so this word uh, in German means uh, flip over Umklapp. And it really physically, that's why it's called that way. It's kind of getting, getting a kick out of, a, say, minus g from here. It's it kind of extracting out a little momentum from here and, and then re-entering from here. Right? So you can think about its consequences and energy uh, you know, what, what, what is due with energy because it will have to dissipate energy. It has to scatter off the crystal and it sets up a vibration and that's a phonon scattering, and for example, right? Because uh, 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 from here you can see you, you have a field that's on, but it's not increasing in energy anymore. You kind of capped it off, right? So that means the energy is going somewhere and it is going in every umklap process. It releases a phonon and it goes out into the crystal, right? So, We'll talk about phonons and other details later, but at least physically it should be clear that when you put a situation like this in front of the electron, it can either do this or it does that, right? And that process where it hops to the next band is called tunneling. It's called interband tunneling, where the electron starts out from one band. And uh, particularly this is called Zener tunneling, uh, when you, uh, in response to an electric field, you can move electrons from one band through a forbidden gap into the other band. Right? from the valence band to the conduction band. That's called Zener tunneling. Uh, and, and this is forbidden in classical mechanics, but it's allowed in, in quantum mechanics. Yeah. So if I have an insulator, then the, the, the band should be completely filled. Yes. Um, but these umclap processes should still be able to happen when I apply an electric field. I should be able to take everything in case space and just get it to go back to the other side. Yeah. But you're saying that's mediated by a phonon interaction, which, like you said, is going to be dissipated as heat yes. in my crystal, which implies if I take a insulator and apply an electric field across it, it's just going to get, I'm going to be dissipating energy and m making things hot. Uh, yeah, no, that's actually a very good point. So in an insulator, because all the states are filled, really, right? So there is no net change in energy. I can't even start out, uh, you know, I, I can't start from a state here, and it has really no, um, so the net current is zero. And you're, uh, let me just make sure I understand. So you're saying that perhaps I have so these everyone hops. Everyone can move. Everyone can move, right. Can move back to the other side. Yeah. Um, so that's a very tricky question. Unless I have an empty state, it's excluded by Pauli exclusion. You can't put. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the thing with the insulator, right? Uh, later on, I'll say, so oh, the, the answer will become much clearer if you look at something called the transverse resistance, in which case an insulator can still have a transverse resistance, meaning, you know, in the presence of a magnetic field, it can have a circular current, but it cannot have a net current in one way. And this is, uh, I think the best way to really uh, uh, understand it is to completely, <laughs> uh, uh, Say, to, to say that these states are not going to uh, change in response to the field because they are Pauli excluded. You know, that's, that's really the one, you know, correct way to kind of say that an insulator does not carry net current because of that. Right? And then, of course, they're, they're exactly right. Now, the, another way to look at it is you can say that, well, I have a very few number of empty states, you know, in which case it's holes now, and they follow the same umklap again, right? So the moment I release any states here, it will do the umklap process. But if it's completely filled, it's probably excluded, and there's, you know, it kind of shuts down. Right? That's, I, I think that, that, that's the right way to think about it. OK, so uh, uh, now, um, so, so uh, you can see that, I mean, uh, in, uh, physically, I give you a reason why uh, you know, the energy will be stuck in that band. But physically, what's going on is that electron, uh, you can imagine, uh, we can extend this picture of what you call as the first. Uh, so as a result, I mean, I can think of the electron to continue here. You know. can think of it that way. So this is continuing here, it's continuing here. And in energy space, E versus K also becomes periodic in K. You know, this is just a way to model this, what I just said, right? It's going to umclap back and keep going in the same band. Right? And never go to the higher band. You know. So, so, so that's, that's, uh, this is called the extended zone scheme. Okay? Physically, I don't think there should be any confusion. The, the you know, uh, electron does this physical process I mentioned, but it, as far as energies go, uh, you can imagine it's going out uh, you know, to a higher state. If it goes to the second band, on the other hand, 
Um, so so uh, it will have a different, uh, you know, w w I, I can function and all that other, other things. But uh, uh, so this, if I extend it, would be called a periodic zone scheme. If I keep everything within one, uh, you know, the first uh, plus g uh, by two, uh, minus g by two to plus g by two. So that that's uh, 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 so this region would be called the first Brillouin zone, right? And then these edges of g by two and minus g by two are the Brillouin zone edge edges, Brillouin zone. Right? So uh, physically, you're going to kind of uh, look at. Uh, you don't have to look outside of the first billion zone to see what's going on in, in the crystal now, because you know it's kind of this point effectively has become that point because of the you know huge amount of you know potential, and it can provide any change in plus minus delta g you need. The crystal has that much potential. Right? Does that make sense? So 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 it's essentially the crystal potential makes this effectively similar to that one, and 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 uh, it's it's wrapped uh, around, and they're the same object in that sense, you know. So. The, there is a difference, obviously, that uh, you know this state is uh, um, f again physically. Then you can again see it started out zero, increase velocity, increase velocity, decrease, decrease, slow down to zero, right? And then it starts out from here, right? And it has velocity that's negative, right? Here, this part of the velocity is all positive; it's all going to the right. It initially went up in velocity and then came down to zero. Now it's going the other way; it's going to the left now, right? The electric field is, the force is still in that direction. The electron initially went that way, slowed down, and then it's coming back. Coming back and coming back to, so it starts oscillating right? in real space. It's going, accelerating, decelerating zero, then coming back. So that's, this, this sort of an oscillation is called the block oscillation, and you know, you're solving a problem on it in two dimensions, right? So this, this oscillation is called uh, the block oscillation. Uh, and, and so it will oscillate in energy, of course, in K and in real space too. You can find out what trajectory looks like in real space you know, in, in, when it oscillates. So uh, we will encounter this again uh, uh, later when we. Uh, uh, but by, by the way, just to be very clear, physically, if you look at the problem, uh, what you have done is you have a material, you know, periodic arrangement of atoms, and there's an electron, and then you have applied a. DC voltage across it, which is driving an electric field. I mean, it's, it has electric field, so has a, there's a DC electric field. Right? But as a result of that, the, in response to a DC electric field, the electron is oscillating. So that's AC, you know, so, right? So, so its velocity is oscillating, uh, and and uh, when a electron oscillates like that, typically you can extract out of it RF power, meaning basically it's high frequency power. You, you apply some DC voltage, and it starts oscillating. And uh, the block oscillation, people have really tried very hard to make it, uh, I mean, ma uh, generating high frequency uh, signal from DC is extremely important in many applications. I mean, a good example is your cell phone, where you know, you, it has a battery which only provides DC energy, DC voltage, but you have to communicate with cell phone towers at four gigahertz, so you have to convert to four gigahertz AC, right? So you always need this, I mean, it's very useful in communications. And uh, uh, and the higher you can go, the better it is. The if you have a really high frequency uh, signal generator, then uh, you can do covert communications because most others may not have it. You know, so so you know, the, so that sort of thing. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, so if you do the numbers here, the oscillation frequency of this will come out to be pretty high you know, in terahertz regime. And you can, it's actually very easy to calculate. You will find out what, what's the time it takes to go from here to there, you know, right? And that's actually just, you put k is equal to g, right? Because it, it changes by g, and you get the time. Right? And 2 pi by that is the frequency you know, that, at which uh, it can generate. You'll see it's terahertz, very high frequency. And it's hard to make ter terahertz oscillators with traditional techniques. And so people have been trying to kind of use this for a long time, but they haven't really succeeded. And the reason for that is the electron really doesn't go like that. It, if you remember, unfortunately, there is always the reality kicks in, and there's a damping. It scatters. Right? So it gets slapped back. You know, it's, oh, then it, something will kind of bring it back here. And so, so that's one of the reasons, at least one of the reasons. There are many others, but this is one of the main reasons why people have not succeeded yet. And uh, uh, towards the 
second half of the course, we'll see that uh, when you make something called a super lattice, where you artificially create another set of periodicity, you can make the brillouin zone much smaller, in which case it has to go much smaller distance here. It doesn't have to go all the way out. And there's a chance that it can perhaps complete a full cycle of block oscillation. So, so that super lattices, people have tried to make uh, block oscillators using that. OK, so uh, uh, now uh, what I wanted to uh, look at uh, uh, is, is, is the uh, concept of uh, effective mass. So uh, is that, I mean, the gap, hopefully, it's clear. Uh, uh, and, and the fact that gap repeats and gets smaller as you go up higher and higher in energy. Now, effective mass. Now, this curvature, we can quantitatively calculate how much is the curvature. Right? We can quantitatively calculate. And whatever is the curvature there, I, I'm going to take that EK diagram. And uh, uh, so what I'm considering now is a state right here, which is g by 2, minus g by 2, right? that's minus g by 2, plus a little you know, k prime, let's say, slightly to, to the right. You know. OK, right? is that, that's one state. And that state is talking to a state there, which is plus g by 2 plus k prime. Right? That, is that so? So because they are separated by G. And now I take those two, and then I create my two by two matrix and find, well, well give me the new energies of those two now. Right? So it, it gives you the two, two new energies of those. Okay? And I write it all out, and here's what I get. So, so I, I'll get, uh, uh, you know, I kind of expanded it out and also did a little Taylor series on it because it's a square root and all that uh, here. This is, and then what I get is E plus K, meaning. I get an expression of this. The energy is here, and I'm going to zoom in now. So I'm going to zoom into that part. So that part is looking like a parabola. And so the expression for this, uh, I, and I've, I've changed my origin in K. I put it here. Right, so put the origin at the minimum of the band of that that little uh, curve here. So effectively, this is g by two in our original uh, original you know k k uh, state. But I'm looking at changes from there. So that's my k prime now. Does that make sense? I mean, this is zero in this new axis, and that's k prime. It's expanding. Now. And uh, so if I look at e of plus k prime after some approximations, uh, how does it look? It started out unperturbed energies were f. You know, and then f was just 8 square g over 2 whole squared over 2 m, m e. Right? Now, I know that it got split into f plus u g and f minus u g. That, that much I know, right? It got split into f plus u g and f minus u g. So I have that part of the energy sitting here, f plus u g and f minus u g. Right? And in addition to that, you have this little extra, right? So for the upper state, for the upper state, this is you know, the energy is F plus UG. Make sense? Okay. And for the lower state here, if I zoom in into this region, it's going to look something like that. And this energy is F minus UG. And then it's going up also in K prime here. It's kind of going down, not going up, it's going down. Right? And uh, so that's now your new band structure for those little regions. It's F plus UG plus this. And what I've done is I pulled out everything to the front, and I've written it as 8 square K prime square. Remember, this K now is just the leftover part from here, you know, with respect to this point. Okay? And so it's curving around that point. So I'm going to write this, because I know that this part is going to be a parabola. I'm going to write this as 8 square by twice uh, k prime squared, but now I am not guaranteed that this is going to be the free electron mass because this curvature could be anything depend upon, depending on the potential, the gaps, and all that. Right? Right? So whatever sits here, whatever sits here, to be able to write it as a parabola is your effective mass of that band. That, that's all. There is. This is the effective mass. So I, I say that, well, I'm going to assume this is like a free electron except now its mass is different and it's still a parabola, but whatever sits here is my effective mass. Right? And, and now in this, this particular problem, you have an exact expression for the effective mass. Here's the exact expression. Uh, it goes as one for the upper curve. Uh, this expression looks like this, h square k prime squared by twice m star, and then there's a one plus two f over ug. 
Sorry, I think I don't know what it is. So, so it's basically 1 plus 2 by ug. So this is sitting in the front here. Uh, and, and as a result, I can take that and say that now I'm, I'm going to identify, sorry, mass of electron here. I'm going to identify that this quantity is actually exactly equal to this whole quantity, right? Right? So from there. And therefore, the effective mass, and I'm going to label it as my upper band, which I'm calling as the conduction band here, is equal to an, a free electron divided by 1 plus twice f over ug. So you get an exact expression for the effective mass for the upper band. And you can show from similar arguments that the effective mass of the lower band will be minus. I mean, be, this will change to a minus. Right? So I mean, just kind of readjusting and saying, what am I calling my band edge? And this is, so physically, what is buried inside this M star term is all the effect of the periodic potential. The atoms, what are they doing to the electrons? It's kind of buried inside there now. Right? It's buried inside there because it has the periodic potential. It has the reciprocal lattice vector. It knows about what is the periodicity of the lattice because F depends on the periodicity of the lattice, right? The fact that there are atoms that are creating periodic potential, this takes care of that, right? And after all is said and done, why are we even talking about the effective mass? Because I already know my expression. Because now you can imagine that the electron, if I have an electron moving in this band, all I have to do is look at its energies, and I'm going to call it EC of K, okay? And I know that I'm going to write approximate now. F plus UG, that's the minimum of that band, plus H square K prime square by twice the effective mass of the conduction band. And now you can see, in fact, I started with a free electron, which had no potential. And then I put in periodic potential, did all my perturbation theory, all that. And finally, I have the new energies of all, after all that. right? And you see the new energies look like this. Here's the band edge, which is the new minimum potential. Okay? And top of it, you still have a parabola now. right? But except the mass is renormalized. It's not the same as before. Right? The mass is different. Right? So, uh, and then you can treat this problem now as the same problem, effectively, as the free electron, except all the periodicity of the lattice, all the potential of the lattice is buried, is vanished into this term now, right? And you can solve the problem now as if it was a free electron. So that's why it's a very important concept, the effective mass, because you don't need it. <laughs> you can actually solve the problem without it, but uh, it helps you to map it to a classical problem now. Well, oh, sorry, the free electron problem now, the transport and all that. Right? So, so that's the reason why it looks like that. The second thing is the effective mass from here, just from the signs, you can say a lot already. This F, which is the uh, you know crystal potential, uh, so which is the free electron potential at the at the brillouin zone edge, F is much larger than UG. UG is typically a very small quantity. In which case, uh, first of all, you see for the conduction band or the upper band, the effective mass is smaller than the free electron mass because you have one over something which is greater than one in the denominator, right? So it's smaller. So the electron is kind of lighter, it, 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 it effectively. I mean, it's not really light. Electron always has the same mass. But uh, the fact that it's in, a, in this crystal, and you, if you want to think of it as a free particle and forget that there's a crystal, the, all the effects of the crystal show up as if the mass has become a little lighter. That's really what it does. You know? Kind of like gravity, if you might, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing you can say is if UG, which is the periodic potential, is much weaker than this F, you can forget about this one because this term is very large. Right? And what you'll get then is that the M star, if this is much larger than that, you'll get M star is roughly equal to UG over twice F times the free electron mass. And what it's saying is the effective mass goes proportional to the gap. You remember UG or two times UG is the gap. So larger is the gap, larger is the effective mass. Smaller is the gap, smaller is the effective mass. And this is a very important property of most semiconductors. If you have a semiconductor with a large band gap, the effective mass is going to be large. And if you have a semiconductor with a very small band gap, the effective mass will be low. So, so that's another thing that comes out here. This is the conduction band. The valence band, again, this term is very large and uh, much larger than 1, in which case it's actually negative. right? You see that? I mean, one minus. So, so we can forget the one is negative. Yeah, Joe, there's a question. Uh, 
I see where this is coming from, but can, can, can you have a scenario where you have a large band gap but still have a large curvature, average curvature in your band, so you still have a lower effective mass? You could. Um, uh, absolutely, you could. It depends on, uh, uh, on, on, on the periodic potential, nature of the periodic potential. But uh, what I would say is if the atoms are the same, the p potential comes from the nature of the atoms, if it's germanium or silicon or carbon or gallium and arsenic, they determine this potential, right? If you keep all these things the same and you take, uh, uh, meaning if you keep the atoms the same uh, and you, you change that, then the trend I said is correct. I mean, the larger is the gap, larger is the effective mass. Now, you can play by going to some sort of different material system and try to make it you know, a little more curved and you can choose a certain orbitals that overlap better. We're going to look at that as well, uh, in which case you can tweak this a little bit, but uh, I think the trend I'll show later, the experimental data you can measure, larger is the gap, larger is the effective mass. You know? so, so that's the trend. You know? And you can always go a little bit off from it, but very, very little. Like, there's very little wiggle room left after. Uh, so I can choose a material where mm, uh, the, uh, also, uh, let me just also say that you can look at this problem and you will see why it must be so, because larger is the gap, uh, you know, the interaction is weak, right, between, because the E1 minus E2 is large, so they repel much weaker now, and the, so it, the, another way to look at it is the reason it's curving is because of repulsion, level repulsion, they're repelling each other because of the periodic potential, and the larger you make the gap, they repel less now, and therefore the curvature is weaker, so the mass is heavier, you know, so, so that's another way to look at it. All right, so any ex exceptions, I'll talk about them when we come to that, but there are very few exceptions to this, really, so. So the mass is negative here, and what does that mean? Again, I mean, this is an infinite source of you know, uh, confusion sometimes, and all of it is really, there's no need to have any of that, right? It's uh, absolutely, uh, uh, you know, okay. So let, let's just look at uh, the bands uh, and, 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 and see why uh, uh, one does not need to. So, uh, so if, I, if I look at this part, the curve, curvature is downwards, if, if, if here the curvature is upwards, right? And, and we can see that uh, the electron, we just discussed that, if, if it's in this part of the band structure and you're moving, it, 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 you know, the effective mass is positive. So it's going uh, effective, I mean, it, it is, it, it, this whole part, the electron is going in the direction it should in response to the electric field. But you go to the other half, it's you know, slowing down and going the other direction, and that means that uh, the electron is acting as if it has acquired a positive charge because it's, you know, right, in, in, instead of negative charge. Does that make sense? I mean, so, uh, and, and if you look at, uh, and, and, and the reason for that, what is the reason for that? Because there's a crystal potential sitting in its way, right? So, so it, it has made it, uh, it has made it, uh, you know, the, 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 the reason it curved down like that is because of the periodic potential and the perturbation, I mean, the fact that electron is interfering with the crystal, right? So, uh, so, uh, so, so, so in, in this part, the effective mass is, is curving up and is positive because the electron is going in the direction it's supposed to in the electric field. In this part, from here to here, is going in the other direction, so it's acting as if it's negative. Right? The char you can think of it as the charge is negative, but actually, the electron charge is never negative. It's always, I mean, so it's, you can think the charge is positive, right? It flips its sign. Or you can think the mass is different, right? Right? So when you're in response to so, so, and, and that's why, and you can do either. I mean, it doesn't matter. So, some, so, so uh, if you think of it uh, as, as, as the, as the uh, charge has flipped sign, then you should consider the mass hasn't. But if you consider that the mass has flipped sign, the charge hasn't, but physically at least. What, it, what is clear is the electron is going in a direction which is opposite to the, uh, in, in real space, it is moving in a direction opposite to the Coulomb force. Does that make sense? I mean, it's going in a direction opposite to the Coulomb force, and that is because the energies are like that and the group velocity is like that because of the, the crystal potential. So, uh, I don't know whether <laughs> that makes it any clearer, but also what you can see is if I uh, move these bands uh, to, all right, let me just uh, go over here. All right. Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, there's a reason why I could kind of continue this band, and you can kind of 
you have the higher band here, you can continue this band here, and you can continue all the higher bands. So that, that, that sort of a picture would mean uh, that you can map all the energy bands of the crystal into the first Brillouin zone. So, so you just, and this is called a reduced zone scheme, and that's what uh, is, is, is shown in, in, uh, in, in this slide. You just essentially, physically you can imagine that I took this band and I moved it this way, took this band and moved it this way, and joined them, and I get you know, that band. At least, uh, uh, so, so this makes it a little easier to draw things. You know, it, it keeps everything in one, one, one you know, small billion zone, and you have to, don't have to draw all the extended parts. Uh, and in this picture, you can see that at a particular k value, this, you know, the band here is curving down. So if I have electric field that's changing the k's this way, and you know, it's sweeping out that way, then it accelerates and then it decelerates, right? But if the electron started here in this band, right? Uh, it's actually going in the other direction first, right? It's going the other way. Uh, it starts out and accelerates in the other direction, then slows down, and then uh, uh, essentially reaches zero velocity here, and it kind of goes back. So, so it kind of, instead of oscillating, if you might, in real space, let's say this way, uh, you know, the, the other one uh, is, 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 is uh, you know, if in this band is oscillating in this way, let's say, in that band, uh, it is going to oscillate in the opposite orientation, if you might, right? So, you know, something like that, I mean, so it, 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 it's behaving as if it's a negative charge, if, if you might. Right? Uh, sorry, a positive charge, but all of these are still electrons. Okay? So, uh, and you can also imagine that it's, uh, um, um, so, and, and all this is just a consequence of a different curvature of the band. Uh, and uh, I can kind of maybe pause a little bit here because uh, all I want to say is, the effective mass is just the you know, inverse curvature of the band. That's all there is. And whether uh, physically, even if it actually, if, if you calculate the effective mass at the center point here, is going from a n negative curvature to a positive curvature. So actually effective mass, you will get the curvature vanishes in the middle here, right? So the effective mass will blow up. That doesn't mean anything to the electron. It's just still going in its K. It doesn't care. I mean, the effective mass is a construct which, you know, it, it's not, it has not much physical meaning if it's blowing up because it's just the curvature of something, right, here. And its physical meaning is lost if you try to associate with it uh, uh, anything more than near the band edges. Near the band edges, effective mass has a meaning, you know, because it's parabolic. The moment you go to non-parabolic, all its meaning is not quite valid anymore, right? So, so uh, whenever you have confusion, you can always come back to the EK and look at the velocities. That's always the right way to look at it. And you know, all other concerns will, uh, whenever effective mass is causing a problem, always go back to EK and velocities. OK, so um, now uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, make sure, so, so typically, this is the way it's plotted, you know, the EK diagram in the first brilliant zone instead of extending out into higher brilliant zones. And uh, I'll move over to, uh, so as a result, you have these points, uh, plus pi by a and minus pi by a's, you know, which are kind of critical points in this picture now. And, and uh, this is a billion zone edge. And I start filling electrons. Uh, uh, so, so by the way, you can see now that uh, when I do this sort of band folding into the first brilliant zone to draw it in the first brilliant zone, it, 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 it looks like there's a crossing at this point now, right? And uh, this uh, picture is, is, is what's called a nearly free electron model, where instead of writing your electron energy as 8 squared k squared by 2m, you write it in a slightly different way. So you write your energy as of k is 8 squared by twice the free electron mass. But now you can see that I can capture every free electron band if I just write it as k plus g squared, where g is any, any lat reciprocal lattice vector, 2 pi by a, minus 2 pi by a, 3 pi by a, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, 4 pi by a, minus 4 pi by a, any, any of those. Any integer multiple is any integer multiple times 2 pi by a, right? So this captures every such parabola, right? It's just that its origin has shifted. If you have g is equal to 0, it's this parabola. If you have g is equal to 1, you know, it's that, and g is equal to minus 1 is that, and all that. It's just, you know, many copies of this at different gauge. And, and, and so when you plot that, and you make the plot of those, all those, 
And then you fold all of them into, so I take this part win here and I move it, you know, uh, by, uh, uh, so, I, so if you start moving each one of them, already you can see that you'll have a, uh, what's called the, uh, you know, the reduced good zone, but nearly free electron model. Right? So it looks like at each, at one K now, I initially had only one energy allowed, but now I have another, and I have another, I have a large number of energies allowed now, right, at, at any K. But physically, that K is, uh, you know, it, it, it's basically the value of that K, if I look at that energy here, if I look at that energy here, it's actually K plus G or K minus G. It's not just, K. so when G is equal to zero, you have that, you have G is equal to one, you have that, maybe G is equal to minus one, you have that, and then so on. So, so these are all different indices now, okay? different indices of what G vector uh, have I used uh, to, cal to calculate that part of the dispersion. And then, uh, so I, I, I can move, uh, move along, and, and I think we already have seen that if I forget about the external part outside of the first billion zone, and I plot everything in the first billion zone, and I can now get all these you know, energies allowed at, 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 at any k. So this is the nearly free electron model of the band structure of an electro, electron in a crystal. So, so the crystal symmetry, the lattice constant determines 2 pi by a, or you know, this a lattice constant. And except, uh, other than that, the energy band structure is just the free electron model. It's just shifted around. That, that's I'm kind of trying to repeat the same thing. But, uh, uh, so, so, uh, okay, here, here, and here. So I've just repeats, and I'm going to basically consider only the first brilliant zone, in which case uh, my bands effectively will be like that. I think it's not well drawn, and then it will go up, it will go up, and, and, and essentially I, I have only, I just have to look at what's going on inside the first brilliant zone. And what will happen in this picture when I turn on my periodic potential, right? As you know, all the action happened at these points, right? So at the, with this picture, what will happen is my bands, I can draw it like this, and then the second band, which was, you know, kind of going out like that, I flip it into the first billion zone, it will look like that. The third band will look like that, and so on. Right? Just to be clear, this part came from maybe, uh, you know, translating from here, that part came translating from there. Uh, and and uh, meaning it has, belongs to a different G vector. So therefore, now you can index them by which G vector it came from. This one came from G vector zero, right? Then came maybe plus one, and that came from minus one, and so on, right? And then these are the allowed energies, and at any K, in the back of our minds, we know that this band has G is equal to zero, this has G is equal to plus one maybe, or minus one, and G is equal to plus two, and minus two, and so on. So, so that's, and, and now you have a band which is complete, there's a gap, a band that's complete, there's a gap, and so on. Right? So, so this is, I start filling electrons, and now counting the electrons, let's say I have, you know, n, n states here, and I can fill two n electrons here, so if I fill only two n electrons, this band gets filled, you have a gap. If you fill three n electrons, this band gets filled, because each state can hold two, and this gets occupied by exactly half, right? So, so you got a metal. You get four n electrons, you get an insulator again, right? So four n electrons being an insulator means two bands are completely filled, and that's uh, 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 actually pretty, uh, very closely related to why silicon is an, in, you know, semiconductor, you know, so it's related to it, but we're gonna come to that. Uh, is that clear? I know, I mean, just qualitatively at least. So because of the periodic potentials, you open the gaps and it goes from this sort of a degeneracy point to it looks something like that for this particular problem here, and so on. <coughs> okay, so uh, a couple of things I wanted to say, uh, 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 the kind of a, okay, so here's, here's uh, something that's actually going to be pretty important uh, soon. Uh, so we started with free electron model and then found the eigenvalues. Uh, we haven't yet really asked too much of what, happen, what happened to the eigenfunctions. What happened to the you know, wave functions for these states? What's the eigenfunction function of this new state? Right? And from, from our perturbation theory, 
we know the result for it. We have a full you know, expression for my new eigenfunctions, and I can write it down. And what I want to show now is that immediately leads to what's called the block theorem. You know, block theorem tells you, here's what block theorem tells you, that if I have an electron that is subjected to a periodic potential, OK, if the electron is subject to a periodic potential, then if I solve my Schrodinger equation for that problem for the electron you know, as a wave, uh, d2 over dx squared plus v of x psi of x is equal to e times psi of x. Right? That's Schrodinger equation. That's the prescription for finding, you know, for any given potential, what are the new, uh, what are the eigen energies, what are the energies allowed, and what are the wave functions allowed. This is what you saw. And it just so happens that if you have a periodic potential specifically, in, in that case, Bloch theorem says the following, that the wave function will take this form, that if I, you know, the solutions to this problem, because the periodic, the potential is periodic, the wave function will look like this. If I take mod square of the wave function, it will be periodic. Mod square. This you can prove in one step from here to here. You kind of change x to x plus a, and you'll see that you, you, this is how it should be. Right? But it only says this for this psi square, right? not for psi. Right? And that leaves you a wiggle room and says that psi of x plus a can be equal to psi of x. So the wave function itself need not be periodic as long as it has a phase factor here. Some sort of e to the power i theta, right? If I have e to the power i theta and you take absolute square, well, it goes to one, right? So that's that's really uh, the block theorem that if I change uh, in response to a periodic potential, the wave function uh, must take this form, and that's really the block theorem. Uh, it's a really mathematical theorem. So essentially, if I change x by a, there's a little a factor that appears in the phase here, and there's a k here. And it, the block theorem doesn't say at all what is this k. It has you know, no, no physical, doesn't give you any sort of a physical reasoning for it. And we'll see now that the k is really that k for, for the electron in a periodic crystal. Right? Now, uh, uh, what I'm saying now is uh, we can get this, uh, uh, why it must be so, also from a perturbation picture. This is a completely non-perturbative picture, meaning it's an exact result, mathematical result. Uh, so uh, uh, if, I, if I just uh, look at the periodic potential and I say that uh, what is my new uh, eigenfunction uh, if I have a periodic potential, and I know that my new eigenfunctions are always the old eigenfunction, you know, plus all these interaction terms that mix in the different states, right? Just like for the eigenenergies, it's the same deal. For, uh, so I'll write, here's my unperturbed term plus kind of a sum with some matrix elements and over E, uh, let's call it unperturbed, unperturbed, uh, uh, sorry, e. perturbed minus M, and uh, all, all kinds of states that couple to it without, you know, this, uh, this, is, this is the form uh, we, we wrote it as. Actually, I don't know why I'm writing this way, psi of M of X. So this is the Rayleigh Schrodinger sort of uh, perturbation result. Uh, physically, what it's saying is your uh, because of the perturbation terms, uh, you have the original eigenfunction plus a little shift. And in the last class, I showed you we put a you know little uh, uh, potential in the middle of a particle in a box, and you could see the wave function shift and respond in a certain way. Right? It's the same thing, same deal, really, right? And we know that in the crystal, because of the periodic potential, I have you know a st any state u unperturbed can only couple with two others plus g and minus g, right? It has only two states it can couple to. Therefore, the new eigenfunction uh, psi of x must be equal to the original eigenfunction, which is unperturbed. That we know it's just e to the power i k x over square root of l. This is the particle in a ring, unperturbed, right? Plus, there are two terms and. I, you can write out all these coefficients. I'm not very particular about them, but you know it's UG over all that. But I'm really after the second, you know, uh, the uh, this part, right? and uh, so uh, so it it will couple to k plus g, right? So I'll write e to the power k plus g times x over square root of l. That that you know because that's the wave function of that state, right? And it'll also couple to something here times e to the power i k minus g. 
right? Does that say this is the new wave function for the electron, right? And now you can take e to the power i k x out completely for all of them, right? So you can see your wave function now for the perturbed state in the periodic potential it looks like either i k x times some big term here, right? That has no k in it. I mean, well, no k in the exponential part in it. Right? So it has, you know, something that looks like this. Now, I just, you know, written out here. But inside here you have g, plus g and minus g. And it has a very nice property that if you move this x by a, right, x plus a, then, uh, <coughs> well, let's see. So, so this part of it, whatever is here, has e to the power i g x's. You know? And what is e to the power i g times a, if you move it by a lattice constant? Right? Yeah, so that g is like 2 pi by a, right? So this is 1. Right? So it comes back to itself, right? So, so this part of the function is periodic with the crystal potential, I mean, it has the same periodicity as the crystal, and this part is the phase factor of the block theorem, e to the pi k. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, so this is actually a proof of the, uh, it's not a proof, it's, a, it's an in indication that the wave function is in the form of a block function. So, uh, you know, this, this, this statement here, you can also write it as the wave function should always look as e to the power, so, I mean, the block theorem is stated in many ways. Here's another way. Uh, it's all equivalent, okay? So you can write it that way. You can say that this times a function, this thing has a periodicity of the lattice now. This is kind of the same thing, really, yeah. And here you see exactly what is that periodicity of the lattice. This is your periodic part of the block function here. Uh, okay, so uh, actually we are a bit out of time today, but uh, I was hoping to get started on the tight binding, which you are going to do in the assignment, but I want to kind of leave it here. Uh, uh, this is the, uh, so please read up the, both the handout and the slides, and uh, I will uh, uh, actually do uh, the tight binding part in, in great detail in the next class then. Okay, so, all right. And read, you're going to hand out the exams. Uh, just